Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. Uh, this is going to be a combination of a talking and an action video. And the topic that we're going to be talking about is um, cooling capacity of a car. So everything that involves your radiator, uh, air intakes, uh, air exits, and uh, obviously the fans and how you may or may not regulate the fans. Uh, what you see a lot with uh, drifting and in racing as well is that um, people make the mistake of thinking that an aluminum radiator is always going to be better than an original radiator just because it's nice and pretty and thick welded but I can show you right now that the absolute bottom of the market uh, I won't mention any names here but I'm sure that everybody can guess like the big players in the budget radiator aftermarket world um, that these radiators are usually not even better than the original radiators it may look fancy it may be like cool aluminum so yeah it's, it dissipates heat better because the tanks are aluminum but radiators are all about the core quality and that's why there are a thousand or fifteen hundred dollar uh, radiators available people may say like hey why is that so expensive it looks exactly the same as the budget one but it's simply it's just a core quality uh, and the material uh, quality that we're talking about. So if you look at radiators there's basically two uh, main types that you could um, put the designs in and one of them is with the tanks on the sides uh, and one of them is with the tanks on the top and on the bottom. Uh, for instance a Toyota Supra Mark IV but many other Japanese cars like standard Land Cruiser or something like that they have the tanks on the top and on the bottom. Um, which means that the coolant actually flows uh, down uh, which means that it gets helped by gravity a little bit so it falls through actually the water pump obviously pumps it uh, but it also gets some help from gravity going from the top tank uh, to the bottom tank uh, which is uh, obviously sounds very good however there's also some drawbacks of that because it can also mean that the water comes through a little bit too fast uh, where it doesn't uh, shed that much heat because obviously the more time the water spends in the radiator uh, the more time it gets to cool down um, so that's not always the best thing like they work perfectly fine on the Supras and stuff I don't I don't mean to say that but uh, it's not the superior design like the tanks on the sides this is what I like and in that type of radiator there's uh, also two types there's the type where the coolant flows from left to right once or there's the uh, type where the coolant flows from le left, to le left to right multiple times um, which is a dual pass or a triple pass radiator and you can spot that um, the dual pass obviously is when the intake and the exit of the radiator are on the same side so that means that it enters goes left and then it goes back again uh, to the right to the other exit so you can see that obviously it's also easy to see because these radiators will have um, uh, sections in them so you can tell like that the tank is in a diff different section so it moves that way uh, that's obviously a very good radiator because like I said it, the coolant will spend a lot of time in the radiator um, and it will uh, lose a lot of uh, a lot of temperature in that um, this is why I'm generally not a big fan of deleting thermostats because it usually increases the speed of the coolant uh, in the engine block uh, in the cylinder head um, so what the coolant has to do it has to transport the heat away from the hot components like from the cylinder head from the engine block into the radiator where the air flows through the fins uh, the fins are connected to tubes which go from left to right uh, which is called a core if you combine these two together um, so the velocity or the speed of the coolant or water uh, whatever you want to use in the cylinder head and in the block is very very important uh, to the function of the cooling system uh, this is also why we always run the temperature sensors in the block so you see a lot of people that run water temperature coolant temperature sensors uh, in the tubing uh, where the water flows through I would like to see what the temperature of the engine is so I always screw them in the cylinder head or some other provisions that may be there uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a specific engine uh, so you you will have a more accurate reading of the temperature and uh, if your car is standing still like we are doing right now there's no flow going through the radiator which means that uh, you're not having the functionality uh, so you need fans for that and there's obviously exactly the same thing with the radiators if you see very cheap fans which may have a very promising 
uh, amount of power written on them uh, so you are checking it on the internet you're like oh this is a, a good uh, fan it pulls 25 amps should be a good fan like this and that CFM but there's a lot of fairy tales being written especially on the ra on the fans that come from the Far East um, I always use a puller fan because that's much more efficient if you take a puller fan which is behind the radiator or a pusher fan in front of it the difference is between 20 and 30 percent efficiency so a puller fan with the same amount of power and exact same blade size and everything blade angle will do uh, 20 to 30 percent more if you mount it behind the radiator uh, compared to the exact same fan in front of the radiator so if you can always use a puller fan um, the standard clutch fan radiators in many cars also work very well uh, which is what i use in um, all the missile cars we never convert missile cars to electric fans the uh, reason why uh, I like to use electric fans is because we also have uh, this habit of tilting the radiator forward a little bit in the cars uh, and that way the air can come through the front bumper and the grill and vent out the hood so the radiator basically sits at I think we do I don't know 20 degrees angle or something like that um, which works very well and obviously then the clutch fan doesn't work because so that's why I use usually two uh, huge uh, spall puller fans and have them vent out of the hood which is what we're going to show you in a little bit on the V8 car so you have uh, an idea how that looks. Another important aspect uh, of cooling the engine uh, is that you need to uh, keep in mind which fuel you're going to use. So you may see guys um, in Formula Drift or wherever uh, running a certain type of radiator and getting away with that and you're like oh well that's also going to work for my car However, most of those guys are on ethanol based fuels, which means that the car runs a whole lot cooler. Uh, and it means that their exact application, uh, if you would copy paste it to your, your car, uh, would not always work uh, as well as it does for them. The next important thing uh, on this topic is a fan regulation. Uh, so a fan um, obviously is one component that draws a lot of power. If you have a, a correct fan, like the fans that we use, they pull over 25 amps a piece. So that's 50 amps just um, in fan uh, power. And these fans typically are on off. So if you put current on them, they're on and they're immediately at full speed. And the startup speed uh, there is the same as the running speed. So it doesn't slowly start rotating like a helicopter. It's just full on the instant you put power on it. Uh, it pulls even more amps doing that. It can pull up to 30 amp doing that uh, So you could pull 5 amp more in that startup phase, which is quite a lot So if you've got two of them and they both start in at 30 amp, that's like 60 amp uh, Which is not a very good idea uh, For your alternator and it obviously will uh, create uh, peaks and spikes in your electrical system Which is not what we want. So I always run a fan regulator um, so let's say that I set my fan regulator to 85 degrees celsius so what's that's like 200 degrees fahrenheit i think sorry I'll, I'll do it all in celsius you guys have to uh do the math um so if i'm on 85 degrees celsius with my button and the coolant sensor starts sensing 70 degrees uh, then it already slowly starts moving the fans like like i said like the blades of a helicopter it starts up um, so you don't have that that uh, spike in uh, in current um, and what also happens is that if you look at the log files of those cars that the coolant temperature instead of spiking like that and becoming um, like a very bouncy line it just stays up there and it's very small. There's also ECUs that can do that of course so you can put the exact same information in the ECU so you can tell the ECU hey um, if it reaches this and that temp uh, make it run uh, but I don't know if ECUs will make it run slowly or whatever maybe they can I'm not sure like the ECU master ECUs that we use are very capable so they can probably do that but I am a simple kind of guy I like simplicity and I like to run a complete standalone uh, fan regulator which has never failed us and uh, if you want to run the car extra cool so you want to say like hey I'm gonna do a burnout or donuts or something 
or you're on a racetrack where you know that the car is gonna overheat uh, like quite a lot, you can put the target temp uh, lower, so you can put the target temp on 80 degrees or something, so the fans will start uh, pushing a little bit sooner. Um, you also don't want the car to run too cold, so everything on the car is designed to run with a certain temperature. Like ideally you want to run your water temperature between 85 and 90 degrees and your oil, depending on the application, but like the majority of drifting engines, they'll, they will feel happy with about 100 degrees Celsius. This is all Celsius, as I said, 100 degrees Celsius oil temp, so I think that translates to from the top of my head, uh, 200 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and 220 degrees Fahrenheit for oil temperature. Obviously, it's also very important to get the hot air out and we will show you some solutions uh, for that. So the materials uh, used, uh, the fans used, the position used for the fans uh, and those kinds of things. So I want to show you guys some things about uh, the radiators in real life because obviously the theory is always nice but it works a lot better if you see some stuff. Over here uh, we have my pro car, which everybody already knows. This has a dual pass radiator and it's a radiator with the end tanks on both sides. So it flows like that. And as you can see, both the hoses uh, are on the same side. So the, the inlet and outlet are on the same side. So it flows in, goes to that tank, comes back, goes through to that tank and goes uh, into the engine. Um, and as you can see, we tilt the radiator a little bit. So the air comes in like this, and then the hood has a specific design this way. So if you take a look over here, you can actually see that you can see the fans from this hole. So the fans are blowing out of the hole just like that, and it comes out. And if you're actually standing over here, you can feel a lot of heat coming out of the car. So this is how uh, radiators were made in the old days. They're made from copper, and copper and aluminum are both very good materials for radiators because they emit a lot of heat, and which is something that we'll talk about a little bit later. However, copper is a little bit weaker, uh, and it's a lot heavier, so it's not used anymore. And as you can see, this radiator has the tanks on the top and on the bottom, so uh, the coolant actually falls through like this, so the gravity helps the coolant pass through, uh, through the radiator. Um, so that's in one way, that's a good thing. On the other hand, that can also be a bad thing because what's uh, gonna happen is that you can have too much speed in the coolant and it passes through too fast um, and it won't pick up that much heat in the radiator. So what do you actually want from the hood of your car? Uh, it may sound like a silly question, but the hood of your car does a lot more than just covering up the engine. And there's a couple materials you can choose from when you have a hood on your car. Most cars will have a steel hood, but there's also cars with aluminum hoods. Uh, many BMWs have aluminum hoods. And obviously for racing and drifting, a lot of people use fiberglass or carbon fiber hoods. And one thing that most people seem to forget is that the material of your hood has a lot to do with the cooling capacity of your car. And the reason for that is because these different materials have different ways um, of emitting heat. So some materials let heat pass through very quickly, like uh, copper or aluminum, and other ones a little bit less easy, like steel. Um, so that's a very important uh, thing to know. We're gonna do a little experiment with that. Uh, we're gonna use some water and we're gonna be using the exact same amount of water for each test. So that's this thing that gets filled up completely, which is 50 milliliters right here. And we'll be using a test setup. This is a plate of steel that we will be heating from underneath. We also have a plate of fiberglass over here uh, and we have some aluminum plate. And uh, the aluminum and the steel are exactly the same thickness. Uh, the fiberglass is a little bit thicker. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna see by putting some heat over here, how much of that heat is gonna travel into this bowl, which is going to be containing um, this amount of water. We will show you this test in a separate video, um, which will immediately be uploaded. So stay tuned for that video on transmitting heat through various different hood materials. I really appreciate all the comments and all the replies. And if you guys want some Drift Jesus merchandise, go over to driftjesus.com for hoodies, long sleeves and all kinds of things and ships worldwide.